Hello everyone, today I want to talk about Baldur's Gate 3 and the expectations that have arisen around the game since it has been doing so well on Steam and everyone is talking about how amazing it is. I myself have enjoyed Larian Studios game Divinity Original Sin 2 and I'm currently not of, you know, able to afford uh, Baldur's Gate 3 but I look forward to the day that one day I will play it. But there has been some interesting discussions around whether we should be expecting better games from AAA studios. And I find it really fascinating because although some people have been making some really good points about the whole situation, I feel like no one has talked about some of facets that occurred to me while I was listening to Asmongold and Bellular and Yongye and all of these people. So first I want to talk about the tweet, then I want to talk about some problems I had with this tweet, and then I want to talk about what I perceive to be the truth about why Larian was so successful, and then finally talk about not only why do bad products exist, but some additional unfortunate realities surrounding game development. And then I will end this talk with what I think the tweet should have said instead. Okay, so let's talk about the tweet. Everyone knows this Twitter thread um, written by someone called Xavier Nelson Jr. I'm sorry if I said that name wrong. He's an indie dev and he basically wanted to talk about this link between Larian's success and the process that Lorian went through in order to achieve this success. And according to him, he had five major points. And number one, he mentioned there was a long dev cycle. So there was a long development time period. I think it was like somewhere like eight years or something like that. Number two, Lorian had experience making two successful games in the same genre before. Number three, there was a long early access period, which allowed them to rule out, you know, bugs and get crucial community feedback. Number four, there's 400 developers in that studio. Number five, um, there is this big brand IP connected to it, D&D, which automatically made it popular. And then he mentioned something called Great Wind, and he defined Great Wind as direct experience, resources, and specialty tooling. Now, the major reasons he gave to me, I think, are a little problematic to start with. Uh, it's a bit scattered, if you ask me. Really, it boils down to two major things that gave Lorian a leg up, which is a long development cycle and experience. Let's all be real here. Because if we look at number three, early access, really, that's actually just more discussion about the development cycle, right? The fact that they asked for you know, community feedback and we're able to iron out bugs because of early access is simply another part of that development cycle, honestly. Talking about, well, there's lots of developers. I think this is really a non-issue since there are larger studios out there like Blizzard, Activision, um, Ubisoft, you know, Bungie. There are tons of studios out there in Japan and in North America. Um, and China as well, of course, and all around the world, tons of studios that are really massive and they are making shit product. So to me, even just saying 400 developers is really dumb. But I think that linked more into his discussion about indie development, and I will touch on that in a little bit. And number five, the big brand IP creating, you know, popularity. Well, first off, WotC did not give money to Larian. There is actually some suggestion that Larian actually had to basically uh, compete or pay for the right to create a game for them. I'm not sure what specifics of that arrangement involved, but certainly WotC was not funneling money into Larian and ensuring that their development cycle was good. Uh, and finally, I just need to point out that the popularity of an IP does not mean that the game will be good. You know, F Fast and Furious is one of the most popular movie series on the planet, and when they made a game for it, it was utter shit. Lord of the Rings, massive IP, fantastic. The game Golem was shit. And then we have Halo. 
<laughs> um, I've heard a lot of people complain about Halo. Halo is a massive game IP and how did it do? Not so great. And then we have, I think, a new con uh, King Kong game coming out that looks also really scary. So these just show that it doesn't matter really how popular an IP is. That's not going to do anything beyond raising the brand awareness. Like that's it. The mainstream will hear about it. Maybe they'll get excited about it. But usually within the first few days, if the game is not good, it's going to drop off hard. So my problem with the tweet really is that it really felt like the devs were blaming consumers for having standards. And it intimated that indie devs were getting major flack for not doing as well as Larian, which in my opinion is a bit of a straw man because first off, Larian started out as an indie studio and only transformed into a larger studio through the creation of BG3. Number two, it is, not really common for mainstream normal people to go and rag on an indie dev for not making something massive. I'm sorry, I, I'm just not seeing it. When Vampire uh, Survivors came out, when uh, the, the popular clone that Asmund was playing came out, uh, when Valheim came out, most people were very positive and excited about what would happen. Basically, Overall, generally speaking, small dev teams are generally not ragged on and it's not, I don't think it's an actual issue. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that indie devs should just get away with lying to consumers. They should be held to promises that they've issued to their funders or their buyers. So if they're saying, hey, if you buy this game, you'll be able to do this, this, and this, you have to deliver what you promised. Of course, this appears to be something even AAA studios, you know, they, they can't seem to do it, such as Overwatch 2, where they promised this PVE content and then we're like, it's too difficult, we can't do it, so on and so forth. So I'm not saying that indie devs, simply because they're a small studio, can get away and just lie to people especially on like Indiegogo and stuff, that's not great. However, what, what I'm going to be talking about from now on is how these AAA devs got in on this and AAA devs need to be held to a higher standard. And honestly, the tweet, not only did it feel like consumers were being blamed for having standards and not only did it, you know, divert a necessary conversation into this kind of straw man theory about indie devs potentially being victimized, but it really did not adequately deal with the foundational issues of AAA studios today. Now, the truth is if we compare Baldur's Gate 3 to other failed titles like Anthem, Halo, Cyberpunk, and so on, um, we can say that major companies are failing for some reason. Larian with less people succeeded and Elden Ring and Hogwarts Legacy which was made by a previous, basically, mobile game developer, uh, Portkey. Um, you know, all of these games actually had a fairly solid debut, very enjoyable games, not burdened with monetization and microtransactions, and customers began to know this, these things and they started asking questions. Now, to suggest something is an anomaly begs the question, where have we gone wrong that a good game is an anomaly. Perhaps we shouldn't suggest people expect less, rather we should suggest that AAA studios start doing some self-analysis. There was some weird hand-waving going on in these tweets and I start thinking, okay, so if we're going to break it down, why did Baldur's Gate 3 succeed where AAA studios failed? Number one, I think it took time, right? It took its time to make a really good game. There was no rushing for monetization sake. There was no pandering to shareholders or directors. The dev team had investment and ethical commitment to a complete product, and they were willing to take the time they needed to achieve that. Number two, it had lots of experience. Like I said before, the dev team clearly respected and understood the genre it was making as well as the IP. They were able to use their in-house tools efficiently and well, the good wind that Zalavier mentioned earlier. And the dev team turnover rate was probably lower, so the devs were able to support each other better. More on that later. And finally, it had proper direction. The CEO uh, was not requesting stupid shit. Management was clearly keeping everyone on task. Even though they did have to delay and it did take time, they were really 
putting a lot of effort into it. We are now hearing how big and comprehensive this game is. So even though they did have to delay and they did have to spend that extra time on it, it is clear that the payoff for that time was really good, right? And the direction of this game appears to be very clear and focused and the scope is respected. And honestly, I think because it was a mid-sized team, when there were issues, no doubt they were able to turn on a dime and the workflow would allow them to make changes more quickly than if you have more separated, fragmented teams in much larger studios. If you are suddenly having to make major changes or something, it's harder for a big ship to uh, correct course than a smaller one. You know, think uh, internet historians Costa Concordia story, where if you imagine Costa Concordia is Blizzard Activision, Kotick is the captain, and he's asking for a course correction. It's going to take time, right? You can't just turn one of those big boats on a dime, and I don't think you can turn a big studio on a dime. So if we are considering these facts that Lorraine had this flexibility, this focus, this experience, and this time, then we can start to make some assumptions about what's going on with AAA studios, right? And we can look at the reality behind what is going on with these crappy products coming out of AAA. So why do these bad games exist? Well, let's first give the devs the benefit of the doubt. So we can say that number one, the devs are rushed and they're not given enough time in order to meet unrealistic deadlines. Okay, that could happen, right? Number two, shareholders and upper management might have unrealistic market goals for certain IPs and genres. So they might be like, okay, so we want to do a pay to win for this ARPG and it's going to be for like casuals and, and these whales, we want to reel these whales in. So how are we going to do it? And if they focus too much on one thing or another or try to please everyone, that can really ruin a game. Number three, the scope of the project shifts too many times due to lack of direction. So this could be another problem. And we know this has happened. It happened with Anthem for certain. And basically, if the white paper for the game was not solid, people start questioning, decisions start happening mid-process, the scope starts changing, and then suddenly devs are being rushed. All right, then we got brand new devs. They're coming into a situation where there's old spaghetti code, they're struggling to understand it. I mean, reading your own own code like a month after doing it and not looking at it for a while is already kind of looking at a Sumerian tablet, especially if you haven't notated it properly. So for me, I can understand a situation where you have these brand new devs, they're coming in, they're looking at someone else's code and trying to understand what's going on, trying to understand why these decisions were made. I mean, it could be a real shit show, right? Uh, and then this whole situation could be made even worse because the in-house tools and resources might be archaic or they might not even be like what the new devs or the incoming devs are used to in previous jobs. So these devs will be confused. Unfortunately, this can lead to a high turnover rate which will leave gaps in projects and create more confusions and, you know, uh, simple errors will start just proliferating everywhere. And finally, you know, in a rush to get everything done on time, because time is money, um, burnout from crunch caused by poor management will no doubt decimate the work environment and the devs and everyone will just have super low morale and the product will show up that you know, it, it will just show. But there's another unfortunate reality. Uh, and the reality is that devs cannot go scot-free. As pointed out by Asmongold, Bobby Kotick probably had zero to do with the decision to telegraph stuff poorly in Diablo 4. So here are some less than favorable things to note about the devs and the situation around programming. So first off, devs are often segmented, I'm assuming, in these games. We can guess that from the various interviews that we've watched together. And I can definitely say that sometimes the right hand may not know what the left hand is doing. So, you know, you got people like Asmongold asking, why does the cash shop and the UI look so good? 
but the game is running poorly? And the answer is because there's maybe two to three different teams working on various aspects of that. And another huge and, you know, kind of important thing is that a lot of these devs might be coming out of school with very specific skill sets in using Unity and Unreal. And these engines are very powerful. They're created to uh, streamline a lot of things, particularly <laughs> Unreal with the use of blueprints. And so then you might have some people who are not as comfortable, you know, hard coding, so to speak, like r typing out actual code, which they might have to do with a more older uh, in-house engine. So we have devs who might be coming out of a kind of sheltered uh, schooling environment and not have any real world experience. Uh, devs are also humans, right? So they are prone to mistakes that's going to happen. Also, devs may not be actually suited to what programming requires. So you have some devs who have showed up, they're in this career, they have no business being there. <laughs> maybe they're more sociable, maybe working alone drives them crazy. Maybe they can't focus for long periods of time. Maybe they just should not be there. And that can happen. That can happen in any, any industry, right? This is not just devs that struggle with this. There are doctors who should not be doctors. There are teachers who should not be teachers. Um, and the reality is that there are more than likely a chunk of devs that have no business creating a video game. Also, devs may not be managed and kept on task appropriately. I think this is particularly true as we're entering into new cultural paradigms where things like schedules and time constraints and things are kind of being questioned as being oppressive and, and there's a whole rhetoric that is coming from certain uh, hyper progressive quarters. Um, as a literary graduate myself, I've heard some of these <laughs> people trying to basically hand wave away the realities of being responsible. You know, imagine, if you will, a, a surgeon deciding not to show up for your brain surgery on time. It's, it's usually applicable to them, but the rest of the world, especially the people, you know, working at their favorite Starbucks, you know, everyone else has to following these commitments to quality and excellence and being on time and everything, but not them, not them. And so it is true that devs being humans, devs having up and down days might be struggling with keeping on task, especially if they're working from home. I know this because I work from home and I am a freelancer. I ghost write for a living. And I can tell you that if it wasn't for my landlord banging on my door for rent, um, I would not be as productive as I would ordinarily be. So I do think sometimes if devs are not managed appropriately, if, if they have cruel managers who are causing them to feel burned out or emotionally unsafe, or on the other hand, if they have managers who are footsieing around and just not calling their employees on their shit, uh, you know, either spectrum of management can cause trouble and can lead to an environment that will not be efficient and will not be able to produce a quality product. Finally, you know, there's some devs who are simply good devs, but they're developing the wrong game. They don't play their own game. They don't understand the problems within that genre that players might face. And the simple issue is that they are in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, maybe they have all the heart in the world, all the passion in the world, all the dedication in the world, but they are just working for the wrong studio at, on the wrong game. And this is just another unfortunate reality. And I don't want to, you know, kick dogs when they're down. Um, there are probably a ton of good devs who are weighted down by co-workers who don't care, co-workers who are burned out, co-workers struggling with emotional or mental problems, co-workers who might be in the wrong place at the wrong time, co-workers who are not being managed appropriately and don't have initiative or don't have um, the same passion and diligence that is required for certain games. So although it's very easy to point a finger at upper management and say, yes, this is where the problem lies, we can't forget that there are probably problems on the ground that need to be addressed. So 
let's end this with what I think the tweet should have said. I think the tweet should have said something along the lines of this. Larian Studios BG3 is an anomaly because it had a team gifted with time, experience, and strong direction and management. Their passion was matched with good project and crew management, a strong work ethic, and realistic goals. Other AAA studios struggling to achieve these foundational aspects will never put out a good game. Expecting good games to come out of poorly managed, directed, explained, planned, or trained environments is madness, as such consumers and concerned devs should call out for systemic change in AAA studios. So this means top-down change. Start really reaching out and changing upper management, ensuring that middle management aren't just leeching and aren't putting their ore in where they shouldn't, that marketing isn't gutting the company like Steve Jobs warned in that one video that I saw on YouTube, and essentially ensuring that middle management is not being cruel or permissive. And finally, then we can look more in detail at what these devs are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Honestly, the reality is that typing hate out at a dev is probably not helping at all. Uh, in fact, I would say it definitely is not helping at all. Um, one single dev can't change a whole uh, systemic problem that is, you know, racking a AAA studio. It's kind of like how people expected Henry Cavill to somehow save The Witcher. You know, he's a powerful guy. He is clearly opinionated and was trying to advocate for some something there, but he could not ultimately, and uh, he had to he had to go. And that I think could be said about devs as well. We need to be gracious and honestly. You know, if something bad is going on, you know, chalk it up first to negligence or human error or stupidity. Malice should be lower down on the list. But when it comes to CEOs and middle management, I do think that there are very malicious, predatory, dark pattern type behavior that will lead to a terrible product. So this is where I'm going to pretty much end. But before I'd let you all go. I want to talk about a small little anecdote um, coming from my experience working as a ghostwriter. I work for clients who basically give me an outline or work on an outline with me, after which I will write a book. And these books will generally be information books or self-help, on occasion, sci-fi, fantasy, that kind of thing. And some of these will range quite large, up to 90k, 110k. So these are by no means small, tiny pamphlets. These will take time, <laughs> will take some energy and some planning. And I'm more of an architectural writer, so I prefer to work with an outline. And as you can imagine, this process is usually not so terrible why I'm still in that business. However, there have been multiple times where clients have come to me with big dreams and crazy ideas and I've had to school them on what a novel can do, particularly if they aim to be traditionally published. You know, it's like the Boromir meme. One does not simply write a story. You have to consider point of view, perspective, the role of the narrator, you know, is it limited or omniscient? All of these kinds of things have to be taken into consideration along with the target audience and genre expectations. Overall, I have discovered to my dismay that passion projects tend to be the most dangerous projects to take on because some of these people will change direction or mess with the scope of it halfway through the writing phase, not the outlining phase. And this can cause real problems. It is actually a massive issue to deliver something within a timely manner. When the management, in my case clients, 
are changing the direction or the scope of the project or are changing the point of the project or the genre of the project. All of these things I could see would mess with any creative. It doesn't matter what field they are working in. That being said, it would be really terrible if I told my clients, well, don't expect George R. R. Martin quality from me. <laughs> uh, that would that would be terrible, wouldn't it? If I told them, hey, you can't expect good quality literature simply because perhaps I'm having a bad day or perhaps I'm being messed around by a client. I am still expected to provide a product that is polished and fulfills the brief. And I really ought to do it in a reasonable time frame. So although I understand how the devs may be feeling, the reality is that we as creatives cannot turn around and tell our customers not to appreciate something that is good or to, to suggest that good quality stuff is an anomaly. Now, do I think BG3 will be a classic forever and ever? I actually don't think so. I, I do think there is a level of this game that is a bit niche. I, I don't know if it will go down in the annals of time, like some of the great classics, but I do have a firm conviction that this game is quite solid. It's a good eight or nine out of 10. And honestly, what else could you want as a consumer? And so for me, I feel that we maybe could say, yes, it's an anomaly, but the important thing is to ask, why is it an anomaly and how can we make it so that Baldur's Gate 3 is no longer one of a kind anomaly? How can we make it so that every single game coming out will have that level of dedication, time and effort Put into it. And that's where I want to leave everyone today. And I wish you all well. Happy gaming.